Hello, uh, I'm Patricia Volk uh, and I'm from Wessex Archaeology and today uh, I'm going to be talking about something a little bit different to what everybody else has been talking about. I'm going to be focusing uh, on training and um, for the last two years I've been involved with the Training in Action project um, which is a British council funded project um, and it was devised and instigated by Professor Anna Leone at Durham University. Um, the aim of this project was to enable local Libyan and Tunisian archaeologists to develop skills in heritage documentation techniques and preventative conservation. <coughs> there are an extensive number of archaeological and world heritage sites um, in Libya and Tunisia, but uh, instability in the region has uh, put a lot of these at risk of destruction, and a lot of them are actively being destroyed at the moment, um, if you've seen any of the news of Tripoli at the moment. Access to these sites is particularly difficult, and so the idea of this uh, project was to train individuals um, in multiple methods of digital recording, so GIS, uh, geophysics, photogrammetry, um, aerial survey, um, and also use that portion of the funding uh, for uh, the, uh, not just for training, but also for buying, for buying equipment, which the training was then going to be used on. Uh, who were we training? Well, that was over 40 individuals from the Institut National du Patrimoine in Tunisia, uh, the Department of Archaeology of Tripoli, and the Department of Antiquity of Benghazi. So my, sorry, my role in the, uh, uh, sorry, my role in the uh, project was carrying out the geophysical training, um, and uh, there were sort of two clear aims of that training: one, to provide geophysical training, to carry out geophysical survey, and secondly, to ensure that the training was substantial enough um, and mem memorable enough that the people who were being trained could then actually go and train other um, archaeologists in, in each respective country. Um, it was also hoped that we could encourage the trainees to integrate geophysical survey into future research projects and employing that similar standard that we use in the UK uh, for multidisciplinary research projects and even commercial work where we try and embed geophysics from a very early stage in these projects. And if we were able to manage this, we hoped that we could create a long-term sustainable model for the protection and investigation of heritage sites. Uh, it was initially funded for two years, but we've just been granted a, a further year for funding, thank goodness. Uh, and um, the geophysical training, as I've said before, the funding, we would buy equipment, um, unfortunately second-hand, because that's all we could afford. Um, but then these, these pieces of equipment would be left in each respective country follow, following the completion of the training. Uh, we chose magnetometry, and um, that was my decision, uh, generally because it was cheaper, um, it was easier to train, and it's probably one of the more versatile techniques, as we all understand. Uh, and then, so if we just look at to, uh, where the training location, so if you're not familiar with Tunisian uh, geography, I know I wasn't when I arrived, um, the site we're working at is a site called Yunko, which is approximately 45 kilometres south from Sfax, and that just gives you a nice wee overview what the site so it's it's a vast site nobody's ever actually been able to find you know the the delineate the site itself it's a uh, multi-period you know you have uh, Phoenician Carthaginian Byzantine and sort of the main extant feature of the site is this huge fortress and then if you can just see to the south here this mound that's actually three Byzantine period basilicas uh, which were excavated in the 50s by French archaeologists so just a quick overview of what we uh, did in 2017 and 2018. Uh, I don't want to say that 2017 was a disaster, but it was fairly catastrophic uh, because I only had one week and uh, my equipment was impounded in customs. I had all the necessary paperwork, but uh, we just couldn't get them out of customs. Uh, so I then returned for a further week and I only had one day to introduce geophysics to over 40 trainees. Uh, so you can imagine how successful that was. But I also did carry out some survey of my own as well. And I was able to identify some, some nice archeological sites that we could train on in the next year. And that was actually really important. So we realized very quickly that it was far too ambitious to try and train 40 people uh, the next year. There was no way we were gonna have a lasting impact on that training with <coughs> these individuals. So we reduced that number to six. So two Tunisians, and happily they were women, and four Libyans, so two from Tripoli, two from Benghazi. And uh, yeah, we were gonna survey around the exterior of these three Byzantine basilicas. So in terms of the fieldwork training, uh, my goal with the fieldwork training was to run training similar to the training I provide in the UK for in commercial practice for uh, site assistants and technicians coming in. Um, at Wessex, we put really um, 
we think it's really important to write procedures and guidebooks and step-by-step -step processes. We think that's a really important part of training. And that's a model that I definitely used here. However, I did have a big translation problem. So a lot of the material I was creating was fairly pictorial. And also, I personally think learning by doing, by practice, is the best way to create sustained, long and uh, lasting training. So with that in mind, I split the training to roughly 70% fieldwork training to 30% processing and interpretation. You might be a bit shocked at that because I know processing and interpretation takes a long time to learn, but I thought I can remotely help with that from the UK. I cannot help them if their data collection is poor in the field. Unsurprisingly, most of the trainees seem to prefer the data processing, the sitting down bit, much more than the field work. Um, and did, I did things like to ensure quality of data collection. I made sure they were downloading in the field, you know, checking their data before they left to go processing. I also deliberately taught them very minimal processing. Um, even when I knew they pro uh, surveyed things incorrectly, but I could probably fix it, you know, uh, with processing, I wanted to get them into the habit of collecting good quality data and not relying on, the, on extra processing. Because again, if they were doing that at the stage when I was in the UK, I can't tell what they're doing. So just trying to get across good data uh, collection was really important. Um, in terms of our results, I don't have much time to talk about them, um, but I'll just quickly show you. We covered about three hectares of survey, quite small, but a lot of obstacles. We find lots of really nice archaeology. Um, and then what I did as well, I actually had the time to do some test pits. And this was so important <coughs> because I ground truthed some of the anomalies that my trainees had detected. And this is where they got it. This was the point where they were like, wow, geophysics is great. You do a survey, you find the archaeology, then you dig a small test pit, which you've easily located from the results of the geophysics, and boom, you've got a grave. They thought it was fantastic. And that really <coughs> helped motivate them with the training. So then, in order to encourage and motivate the training, the trainees to carry out further geophysical survey by themselves, because you can only learn by doing, by practicing, um, I set them a task of uh, proposing to me a mini project. And uh, that was where they'd have to go out and survey by themselves. Um, and then we'd come back and we'd review the, the mini project and uh, they would disseminate it to their peer group, to the rest of the training and action project. So here's some of them carrying out their surveys. Whilst the uh, mini projects were going on, I was doing some sort of remote training, as I've called it, uh, which uh, was basically snooping on Facebook. So I really encouraged them to document what they were doing and put up loads of photographs. I did try to do it through sort of an email chain, but they were more interested in, in Facebook. So I spent a lot of time video calling and um, assisting them. And by my snooping, I was able to see when things were going slightly wrong and wondering why their data looked a bit odd. So they were able to present the mini projects in 2019 with some successful results. I'll just say one that I'm so proud of. One project was able to identify unknown archaeology on the edge of a large multi-period site, and that's now going to be further protected. So, I mean, you can't ask for better results than that. Future training, I do understand that we need a hell of a lot more training with uh, processing, interpretation, and dissemination. So that's what we're going to do this year. Uh, learning outcomes, I think the most uh, of these outcomes are fairly obvious to all of us. Um, I just think it's useful, however, to review how we engage with local community groups and providing geophysical training and thinking about when we go for future applications that we should be trying to find those funding applications where we can actually buy the equipment as well as providing the training at the same time. Um, and also mini projects are so useful for encouragement and motivation. Um, and then in terms of has it been a success, uh, I think so. Uh, we, we are collecting data beyond the mini projects, but can we sustain that momentum following the completion of the training project? Will they still go out and survey? Thank you.